and you just know this is, this is not good. It's not a good place to be. And you kind of miss God as well when it's like that. We, we've all been there, and I'm going to talk a bit about that as well. So I went to New Wine. I was really looking forward to it because how can you not meet God when you're with him for six days in a field? And it's war to war, God and the Holy Spirit. You will hear God in a place like that in six days. In God's presence, you will hear God and he will touch you where you need to be touched. And he'll say great things to you. He'll tell you that he loves you and he'll minister to you. So have a think about places like that, going to New Wine next summer. You know, God's there. It's got to be great. It's more delightful than wine, as, new, as Song of Songs says. I used to get up to the crack of dawn. There used to be a service there at about quarter past seven. Then it was led by Charlie Cleverly. And I, I really like Charlie Cleverly. He, um, he is the um, priest in charge at St. Aldots in Oxford. And uh, he actually preached the very first time I went to um, New Wine um, about 13 years ago. And he's, he's got the ear of God, and he's someone who spends quite a lot of time. So he did um, six days on Song of Songs, and he, he wrote a book, The Song of Songs. And, um, you know, I've just been feasting on this. Look at this. It's got all oh, my hand post-it notes and highlighters. It is a book to be devoured. And, um, you know, if, if today resonates with you, it's, go and get it. <laughs> It'll be at the Christian shop. There's some meditation things at the end of each chapter. It is delightful. Have a think about that. Okay. So, Song of Songs. What is this book about? Well, it's a strange book. It's a bit risky speaking about Song of Songs here. We're in Anglican church, for goodness sake. It's about human sexuality and sex and intimacy. Um, we might call it rather racy in terms of the Bible. I'm amazed, actually. I listened to the BBC did a series um, on the King James Version of the Bible, which is about 500 years old, and they had got these actors to read out sections of the Bible. And uh, I tell you, the Song of Songs version is well worth listening to. And um, how those crusty old priests kind of wrote something quite beautiful. It is a, that is a miracle. <laughs> it is a miracle. Actually, the book does not contain, it doesn't say anything about God at all. God is never mentioned in the Song of Songs. But God put it in here for a reason. In the Jewish tradition, it is the Holy of Holies. So it's really quite precious. It's part of the wisdom collection of books. So we've got much to learn and discern from, from God and what he is saying. Okay, that's kind of a background. What is that book about, Song of Songs? There are three ways of looking at this book. And the first one is about a relationship between a young man, who is said to be Solomon, and a young shepherdess. And so we can read it as a sense of poems written between the two. And so we can see it from a very earthly um, viewpoint. It's got much to say about the human, um, I suppose, relationships. And we can see how their relationship develops over, over, over the chapters. But I think it's more than that. There are two other kind of lenses or prisms we can look through. And they include that they're basically about the divine romance. And we can see that it's about the bridegroom and his bride. Well, the bridegroom is Jesus, and the bride is his church. So we can kind of see it from that point of view. So as we're reading it, we can kind of listen to what is Jesus saying to his church. Actually, what is Jesus saying to Christ church? But I think it's also about the relationship or love affair between Jesus and you and me. So there are three things we could, three lenses we can look at. A shepherdess and a young man, Jesus and his church, and Jesus and you and me. And we'll be talking about those as we go through it. So God is using this story 
to show his longing for us individually and he's inviting his church to go deeper with our relationship with him. And I think that is the purpose of this book. It is an invitation to go deeper for Christ Church and for you and me personally and individually. Right, we're now going to dive straight in. Verse 1. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. So what we've got here is the beginning of a poem, and it's the bride, the shepherdess. And she's got to the point of pleading for the next stage of intimacy with a young man. So they have been together, perhaps fleetingly or for a period of time, and the shepherdess is kind of wanting more. The phrase, let him, let him. She is being bold and she is taking a risk. She's saying, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. A kiss, the first kiss, shows vulnerability. It shows mutual respect and it changes things between two people. This is not a peck on the cheek. At this point, I was going to invite, in fact, I'm going to do that, invite you just to think and remember the first kiss you had with your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend. Think about how you felt. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> Who is the bride? The bride is the church and it is you and me. And it is a call to go deeper. It's saying that this is not enough. And Charlie Cleverly wrote this great phrase. I'm just going to read it out to you. It says, it is as if a young person or a person who has become a follower of Jesus, perhaps started to read the Bible, is enjoying friendship and community when in prayer, or when reading the New Testament, and they find themselves looking and longing for more. Looking and longing for more. That's what this book's about. I hope and I pray that I am not the only one who is looking and longing for more in this church. And I pray that now. I pray that I am not the only one in this church looking and longing for more in my relationship with Jesus. There are times, and that can be kind of now, that I am not 100% satisfied with my relationship with Jesus. And sometimes I think, is this it? I haven't got much to complain about in my life, and I praise the Lord for that. But sometimes we can go, is this it? There's a scripture, John 4, verses 13, when Jesus meets a Samaritan lady at a well, and she's by herself. And Jesus does this amazing thing because he's not really supposed to speak to her. She's a Samaritan. And he talks about living water. And he says, you know, if you drink normal water, you'll thirst again. But if you drink this water, this living water, you will not thirst. Now, I can remember speaking to another vicar about this and thinking, well, actually, I'm still thirsty. Are you still thirsty? Are you hungry and thirsty? Are you satisfied with your relationship with Jesus? Because that's what this book is about. It's about longing and looking. It's Jesus' courtship with you and I. Are we still thirsty? 
I pray now, if we're not hungry and thirsty, I pray that the Holy Spirit will do that to this church. I'm sorry about that, but it'll be good for us if we are hungry and thirsty. I pray this. I'm the first one at work, and it's really good. I encourage you to do this as well. I pray that prayer out loud in my workroom. I'm the first one in, and I pray that every single one in that person, that there's lots of people, there's about 15, 16, 17 people in there. And I pray to God that he will make us all hungry and thirsty. And I pray that Monday to Fridays, and I can't wait for the result. There's another challenge. In your workplaces, in your family homes, or wherever, you, wherever God takes you, pray that people that you meet and you work with will be hungry and thirsty. And pray for yourself that you will be hungry and thirsty. Because actually, Jesus is worth knowing. We shouldn't take second best in our relationship. Now, the kiss of God is a metaphor. It is not kissing Jesus in a sexual way. It is a divine kiss. And it's God in God's invitation for us to go deeper with him and not to be casual. It's a prayer I want to put in later on, but again, this is what Charlie Cleverly does this beautiful phrase. It's like God's hand is on our heart. This is what the kiss is. It's like God's hand on our heart, expanding our capacity to give of ourselves to him and to receive his love. And I pray that he helps us as a church and he expands our heart and our capacity to give, him, give of ourselves to him. Are we hungry and thirsty? Are we satisfied with our relationship as it is? So how do, we, how do we get deeper or go deeper in our relationship with Jesus? Well, verse 4 says, Take me away with you. Hurry. Let the king bring me into his chambers. This is not a meeting room, so you don't kind of meet that type of relationship with Jesus in a meeting room or necessarily in public places. Now, I'm not saying you can meet God here today, and I really hope and pray that you do. And you can meet it in your home groups, and you can meet it in all sorts of ways. But that's not an intimate relationship. And if if we want to go deeper in our walk and with Jesus we need to send we have, we have to have some time alone with him because think about you know you married couples or courting couples how did you develop your relationship I'm hoping most of you weren't chaper- you're not that old that you're going to be chaperoned we're not talking pride and prejudice here are we um, but you spent time together alone, walking and talking and doing things. And the same is with Jesus in our relationship with him. We need to spend some time with him. We need to learn to linger, to, to slow down. It's finding time to rest and to be in his presence. It's not always doing, and you know, I'm like this, and a big chunk of you are like this as well. We rush around like mental things, and you know, we're always doing this and that, whether it's church or family life. We need to slow down, have a bit of rest, take a time out with God. Some people go physically walking, they go out with a dog. And they go out and for a walk and they invite God along with him. And that's, that is a great way to deepen your relationship, to spend time. And the dog gets a walk as well. It's listening, not just talking. Okay, a reality check. You guys, some of you guys have been around the block a few times in your walk. You've been 
doing miles of walking to and from church for a very long time. I've been a Christian for 15 years, and some of you have been Christians for a lot longer. You know what to do, how to get, go deeper with Jesus. You know how to do that. You've been to so many sermons, you've heard this. I'm not going to say anything radical now, other than this. You've heard loads and loads of sermons about the importance of spending time in the Word and prayer and practicing His presence and lingering with Him. You know that in your heart of hearts. It's about intentions and priorities. You know, do you want that? Do you want more of Jesus? Are you satisfied? This is why I don't want you to be satisfied, and I hope you, it makes you not satisfied. So because that forces us. That's where I feel like I was before the new wine. Because if we hunger and thirst over a period of time, the more hungry and thirsty we get, the more God is going to draw us. Because I think we do, want to, as a church, we want to go deeper. I mean, I think we want that individually. I pray that the Holy Spirit will increase our longing and thirst for him in our own lives. His love is more delightful than wine. You could put anything more delightful than chocolate. Um... It is, it is worth experiencing. We know that. You know, we have ups and downs. Sometimes, again, I was talking, talking a bit about this, the ministry team yesterday, but also with some friends, Jeff and Chris. And, um, you know, sometimes you have, you're really quite close to God and you think, oh, this is so amazing. It is more delightful than mine, our relationship. And then, before you know it, you're kind of thinking, I'm, I'm kind of not with God anymore, and I'm missing our relationship, and you think, how did that happen? And the enemy doesn't want us to spend time with God. He won't come at us full on, because it would be obvious then, and then we would get our sword of the Spirit out, and we would shoo him away. What does he do? He do? He encroaches on us very subtly. And so we end up doing things that s- start to replace our time with God. So for me, I could do a bit more running. I could finish the end of a chapter in the book I'm reading. I could be tired. I just want to lie down. I don't know. You, you, you can fill out those spaces for your own life. There are things that, that the enemy uses to unhook you from your relationship with, with, with Jesus so that you don't spend time with him. And you know, I, I, I'm kind of thinking, I hope that, I, I'm quite in a good place, fortunately, and God has been very generous to me. He's kind of really kind of <laughs> been in my face about it. And I'm thinking, well, I, I don't want to kind of not be with him now, but uh, I want to keep there. Don't think of me as someone's kind of super spiritual and not, oh, yeah, that's all right for Dean and, and for some other people here because they're really kind of, wow, they're holy people. I'm not holy. <laughs> my home group know that. <laughs> and, my, and, my, my prop, and my other friends know that as well. But, you know, we're... No, yeah. And we shouldn't put, the, as we said, the vicar on the pedestal either. I think vicars are work, walking through their faith, their relationship with Jesus just as much as we are. They might know more scripture than we, but they're human. You know, they're, we fall into temptation, we give in to sin, we have our ups and downs with our relationship with God. His love is more delightful than wine. I've, um, at the back of the notice sheet, I, this is one that I kind of uh, um, used, Charlie Cleverly's. That book is full of uh, meditations. And this was just uh, one I've kind of adapted for us. 
and I've called it learning to linger with Jesus. This is not the only way to, to spend time with, with Jesus and building up your relationship with him. But take this away. Have a go at practicing it. There's a couple of scriptures at the bottom. You don't have to use those. You can use whatever scriptures you would find helpful. Don't give up. Okay, don't give up. Okay, reasons why we may not be ready to draw close to Jesus. Now, sometimes that's because we've been sidetracked and the enemy has kind of, um, put, uh, well, put things in the way and we've kind of started to neglect our relationship. But sometimes there are other reasons and that can be our self-worth and that can be the self-worth of the church, as in Christ church, and us individually. We may not think we are good enough to be in the presence of Jesus. And there may be reasons for that. Verse 5 and 6 says, the, the bride says, dark am I. And then she goes on to say, do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. She doesn't kind of feel that she, could, she should be in the presence of her lover. And sometimes... I think we all get into a situation where we don't feel um, we deserve to be in a relationship with Jesus either. And that's primarily to do with, well, it is to do with sin. And that can be sin that we experience, but it can be sin done to ourselves by our own hands and actions. But it can also be sins that other people have done to us. So we've been hurt and wounded by things that people have said and done to us. It might also be that what about the sins that I have done to others myself? And I think those kinds of things, and I think that happens to, this, that's what happens in this church, it happens with most churches and situations. You know, we <coughs> sin for other people. We cause, we've got sin in our life because of what we have done to others and what others have done to us, that we're hurt and wounded. And sin is awful because it makes us want to hide. Just look what Adam and Eve did. They sinned, and what did they do? They, they hid in some bushes. That's why sin is awful. It makes us hide from God, and it makes us that we don't want to spend with him, spend time with him. But that's not the end of it. Chapter 2, verse 14 of Song of Songs says this. And this, this is Jesus saying this to, to Christ church. And it's Jesus saying this to me and you. He says, my dove, my dove in the clefts of the rock, in the hiding places on the mountainside, show me your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet, and your face is lovely. That's what Jesus is saying to us, and we need to receive that as Christ church, and we need to see, receive that, you and me. Our voice is sweet, our face is lovely. Why are we hiding? That's what he's saying. Why are you hiding? Show me your face. Show, let me hear your voice. Returning to chapter 1, verse 5, what does the bride say? Dark am I. Do not stare at me. What's great about this verse is actually some people believe that Jesus interrupts her. I'll just find it in here. So chapter 1, verse 5. She says... Dark am I. I, I'm sinful. Dark am I. And Jesus interrupts and says, yet lovely. Dark am I, yet but lovely. 
dark am I, yet lovely, O daughter of Jerusalem. Do not stare at me, but you're lovely. Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. Your voice is sweet. Your face is lovely. Receive that. There'll be some time at ministry later on. I I, I really hope the Holy Spirit kind of really uh, touches us here. I stumbled on this last bit of scripture I want to read out. I stumbled on this piece of scripture about a couple of weeks ago, and it really stopped me in my tracks. It's Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Look at the message version of it. (laughs) I had to check that it was right. I was kind of taken aback. So Romans 5, verse 20. How about this for a piece of scripture? Sin didn't and doesn't have a chance in competition with the aggressive forgiveness we call grace. When it's sin versus grace, grace wins hands down. I think that is incredible. (laughs) That's what Jesus' love is like to us, aggressive forgiveness. The Lord Jesus aggressively forgives. I pray that we would know more of that in our lives and as a church. You know, Jesus really wants to forgive. It wasn't just kind of like a little, I don't know, a little small point on the agenda. It was like, you know, this is my purpose. It's like I'm climbing on that cross. I am going to die on that cross. And that's why he's quite rough on some of his disciples. Get away from me, Satan, as he says to Peter. I'm going on that cross. That's aggressive forgiveness. And you can sometimes see that in um, the uh, Mel Gibson film, um, The Passion. And there's a bit when it's almost like he's trying to get almost like climb on that cross and he's putting his hands out and you know this is not kind of someone doing that it's kind of like him doing it do you know you're worth that much that's what you mean to Jesus so wrapping it up now So are you unsatisfied with your relationship with Jesus at the moment? Are you hungry and thirsty? Will you, will you respond to Jesus' call to go deeper into a relationship with him? Will you? The bride said, let him let him kiss me with the kisses of his, of his mouth. Are we hiding or have we turned our face away from Jesus? Then I will pray, then I pray that you will be bold and take a risk in moving into the next stage of inter- intimacy with Jesus. Now what I'd like to do, and this is a bit of a risk for all of us, but we believe that Jesus Christ is here, we've invited him here this morning. And I wanna do some kind of, invite you to to experience some ministry. There'll be kind of two parts to this. I'd like us to stand in a few minutes and just receive the ministry of the Holy Spirit where we stand or sit. And so we'll have a period of ministry there and then if you want any more ministry and please do and it could be the things I've talked about today it could be anything else come and join us at the end of the service and me and some others will be very very pleased to um, pray with you and pray for the Holy Spirit to come and minister minister you you where your point of need is so I'm hoping you'll be kind of up for that you know Jesus is loving he thinks you're beautiful he wants to hear your voice. He's a, 
He's a Jesus who believes in aggressive forgiveness. Okay. So I'd like to invite you to stand, or if you can sit down if, you, if, if that's easier for you. But I just invite you just to stand for a few minutes. Okay, what we're going to do is kind of linger in God's presence. So we're going to have a, a moment of quiet. And then we're just going to wait on, on the Lord. We're going to wait for the Holy Spirit. So I'm just going to invite him in a second. I just invite you to close your eyes. Some of you are doing that now. It's best if you close your eyes because then you don't get distracted by others. And sometimes we can feel a bit self-conscious. And that you may want to also just kind of... I'm, I'm trying to think what the phrase is. Just... Um, <laughs> Yeah, move your hands out slightly so you can kind of receive. Um, but you don't have to do this. But it's just standing in a posture of kind of, actually, I, 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 I'd like the Holy Spirit to come and be with me. I might read some things out in your mind or quietly. Just feel free to, to repeat them, okay? So Holy Spirit, Lord, we love you. We are here because you brought us here today. And um, we, we just invite you into this space. So come, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit.